Hey, in today's video, we're going to be looking at lighting modifiers and how they relate to food. There's loads of videos out there showing you different modifiers and how they act in portrait photography, perhaps in product photography, but there's not that much out there explaining the different range of modifiers available and how they work in food photography. So with the help of my friend Rick, we've set up a, a pineapple and we've taken loads of different shots using different modifiers. The camera's been locked off. We shot with a 5D Mark IV and a Canon 85mm 1.4L lens. And that was locked down for the duration. The pineapple didn't move, the camera didn't move. All that we changed was a modifier on the light, which was a 500 watt light. And I'm gonna talk through the differences between these modifiers and how you can really utilize those in your food photography to tell a story or to get the look you desire. So we're gonna start off with a small softbox. This is perhaps the staple of the food photographer. Generally speaking, we want to use square and rectangular modifiers for most of our work. As with everything, rules are there to be broken, but generally speaking, we want to try and create a natural environment. And when we're eating, we're normally near a window, normally in the dining room, at least in the UK we are, and the windows are rectangular or square. And because of that, the catch lights and the tomatoes, they make more sense if they're coming from a rectangular or square source rather than a umbrella or an octobank or anything else. Like with all things, there's lots of different ways to do it, but this is the softbox. We've lit everything left to right. The, the light is coming in at a straight angle right across the scene. So you can also see the fall off. So I'm just gonna zoom into this here. We can see we get a good rendition of colors. It's very soft light. And as it falls into the shadows, there's a nice gradation there. Now that's affected by a lot of things apart from the modifier, but as we go through the different shots, we'll be able to see how that has an effect on things. It's also worth noting the color, the contrast, and the general brightness of the scene. It's quite an evenly lit scene. Now in front of all of my softboxes, I place a scrim. And this is what this is depicting here. The scrim is a roll of tracing paper, in effect. I pop a link to an Amazon affiliates link in the description. Every little helps. But these scrims, they just they had an extra bit of diffusion and a bit more control as well. Now I'm gonna do an entirely separate video on scrims just to show you how versatile they are and how affordable they are. It is, if you're gonna buy one thing as a food photographer, the first thing you should buy is a roll of tracing paper. If you're feeling a bit flush, get some Roscoe scrim. It is so versatile and so useful. We go through rolls and rolls of it here. There's always at least four or five kicking around in the studio at any time. Go out and buy a scrim, you won't regret it. So the first thing we did was start working with hard modifiers with a scrim. So what we're doing here is bare ball. So it's just the light with nothing in front of it at all, apart from a scrim. And you can see there's some spill on the background. I mean, if, if we had the chance to move everything around and it wasn't a controlled environment, we would sort that out. But just by using tracing paper and a bare flash, this is the light we get. If I jump back to the previous image with the softbox, you can see it is softer, but not by a lot. So a good softbox is probably around the two to 300 pounds, which is 250 to $375 mark. Cheap softboxes are awful. I wouldn't advise buying a cheap softbox. Definitely go for at least at the low end, which is what I use, the Bowens kit. If you've got the money, spring for the Bron color kit. If you haven't, by a 15 pound roll of tracing paper. As you can see, it does a great job. And if you're worried about the light spilling out too far, we can just use bits of black card just to create our own DIY softbox, which is something I do a lot in the studio. So this time we're using a spill kill. Now this spill kill is quite a wide one. It basically stops the light going backwards. And we can see from the scene in general, it's got a bit darker because that light has become more directional. And as we come in close to the pineapple, which is a really handsome pineapple. It's a, it's a bit more specular, I'd say, in the second image, which, which figures because there is a specular element to the spill kill. But apart from that, it's much of a muchness. If you're tight on money, don't buy the spill kill, just get a bare bulb and some tracing paper. Okay, moving forward now, this is the seven inch reflector. So these are the reflectors that most studio heads come with as sort of like default. I use them quite a lot. I definitely use them when I was doing portraits. We're still getting some spill on the background at the top. 
we go to the previous shot, you can see it's just controlled it a little bit, but not enough. But that's more to do with the length of the scrim and the fact that we just didn't put more out because, well, time, time's always short. I would say it is very similar. There's a bit more of a specular element, so it's a bit more punch and a bit more contrast, but not a great deal. You know, there's much of a muchness. Yes, it is different, but it's not so different that if you were starting out, you'd want to buy one of each. It's more of a fine tuning moment. So after that, we've added a honeycomb grid to the light. So this is sticking with the seven inch reflector of the honeycomb grid. You can see the difference, mostly in the ambient, the pineapple stays pretty much the same and the background has dropped down. Now, this is a great tool to have. Using these, the scrim, it allows us to keep some softness to the light whilst being very contrasty coming into the shadows. We've got a nice fall off, which is mostly to do with the distance of the light to the subject. But the modifiers, they, they do sort of amplify this. And you'll see this as we go along. I mean, if I had an hour long video, I'd be able to put some more information into it. But for now, you should be able to see that what we've done here is we've mostly brought the background down. So sometimes in a food shot, you'll find one item which just isn't, isn't popping like it should. And using a really tight uh, a grid on a reflector and shooting that through a scrim to match the softbox you're already lighting with is a great way just to pick that item out. And often if we've got one giant light source going on in a shoot, I'll have five or six studio heads with grids on them just to pick out key elements of the shot. So this is the beauty dish. Going through a scrim, it's lovely light. It's not as specular. It's not as punchy, I don't think. But it's definitely a beautiful light source. If you already own one of these and you want to get into food photography from portraiture, all you need to do is buy some tracing paper. I wouldn't advise buying this as a food photographer. It's not something you're really going to reap the benefits of, but it's certainly something worth picking up at some point. You know, once like me, you've got more gear than you know what to do with, you start going, well, I don't have one of those. Maybe I should buy one. Which is a brilliant segue into the next modifier. This is the sun reflector that Bowens used to make. And the idea is that it creates natural looking sunlight. Now shooting it through a scrim doesn't really do it justice. The best way to use this is perhaps the backlighter shot just to give that haze coming through the image. It's great with drinks. It's great on anything we want to give like a morning, summer's morning, spring morning vibe. Brilliant modifier. Shooting it through this, it just acts as a bigger spill kill. There's no, you know, there's nothing to write home about here, but definitely worth having. Okay, now we've taken the scrim away. You'll notice the odd little bit in the top left-hand corner has disappeared. Apologies for the creaky stall, which is really bad news stall. I'm not sure why I'm still sitting on this. The bit from the scrim where it was spilling through, that's gone now, so we've got more even lighting here. Now if I flick back to the previous image and then onto this, if we zoom in here, you'll notice, so this is with a scrim, with the same modifier, without a scrim. The shadows just really drop quickly. You can see that there, just working its way through. Just flicking between scrim and no scrim. Now with this particular item where it's very textured, there's lots of you know gradation of colors of greens and yellows. I think without a scrim is a really good way to light it. However, with some food types, maybe a pizza, you probably want a more even soft light. So lighting the pineapple, I'd choose this. And if it was a pizza, I'd throw this scrim in front of it. And that's how I'd play with those two different options there. So now we have the beauty dish without a scrim. And it is nice light, and I think it has its place. If you are a photographer who's been shooting portraiture, and that's how you got into photography, you've bought a beauty dish and you want to go into food, it does have its place. I would probably always throw the scrim in front of it, but I think this looks pretty good. Now with a seven inch reflector, you'll notice the beauty dish was spraying light all over the background. We've now tightened this up with the seven inch reflector and it's really focusing that light onto the pineapple. For me, it's a bit too contrasty in this particular shot, but like with everything in food photography, it's, you know, it's horses for courses. You choose the right tool for the right job. In this instance, it's not the right job. And as we add the grid to it, you can really see how it darkens the background. Now, the exposure is slightly off on this because it's a bit tricky to get the grid in the right place following the protocol. But if we look at this here, and then when we had the diffusion in front of it, you can see how this works. And this doesn't really work at all. So just by adding, you know, a 15, $20, 15 pound 
piece of tracing paper in front of it. We've gone from this, we take it away, and we end up with this. Nothing else has changed. We've slightly changed the power of the lights just to, you know, let us keep the camera settings the same. But apart from that, everything's exactly as it was. So that's just looking at some of the lighting modifier options. We didn't go completely bare ball because it would just look awful. But there's a few good options in there. And I think as food photographers, it's very easy to, you know, jump onto a shop and go, oh, I'll buy this umbrella. It's a great price. It's cheapest or whatever it may be. And that's brilliant. However, food photography, we're normally working within the realms of reality. Yes, we can do some abstract work. Yes, we can do some cool composite work. But my bread and butter is shooting flat lays. So we shoot big flat lays of beautiful food. And that's why we end up using the kit that we do use. So if you can see, wrong hand, just above me here, this is a giant softbox. It's bigger than me. And we'll often have that on the side as a huge lighting source. And that will sort of just create beautiful soft light spilling across the image. It also means that we can move it far enough back that we can really take advantage of the inverse square law and get even lighting across the table without having to sacrifice the size of the modifier because the size of the modifier is relative to the subject. So if we use a small softbox and we start taking it further away, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it actually becomes a hard light. But there's something, I can't do this, I'm looking at my laptop down here. There we go. Something this size where it's bigger than me, I can have it on the other side of the studio and relative to the set, it's still a pretty big soft light source. So lighting in food photography is absolutely key. Whether you're using natural light, you're using a window and then just dropping down some tracing paper as a scrim, or if you're doing something a bit more elaborate in a studio like mine, where you're creating your own reality and you're trying to make it, you, I guess the best way to explain it is I'm always trying to create a feeling and evoke an emotion towards the food. If somebody's eating some fish from down by the seaside and it's in spring and it's, you know, it's lunchtime, I need to know where the sun will be at that time of day what kind of light, what quality of light is going to be coming through. And I try and recreate that scene. So when you look at the image, which is shot in this big old warehouse, it makes you feel like you're at the seaside eating the fish in September at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And I need to try and you know, bring all of that together and recreate it using these modifiers. But they are just tools. The most important thing is that you make the food look good. And this is like the icing on the cake. I hope you enjoyed this. It's absolutely sweltering in the studio. I've had to turn the air conditioning off. It's 30 odd degrees in here. So I'm probably looking a bit clammy at this stage. If you did enjoy this video, please do subscribe and share it with your friends. If there's anything that I've covered badly, or if you'd like to see me do differently in the future, leave me a comment and I'll do my best to rectify it and make it a more enjoyable experience. I'll see you all next time.